And uh, so this morning's message was part one on a series on worldliness. So um, next Sunday night we'll have the second installment. And we'll, I don't know how long it'll go. We'll just have to wait on the Lord and he'll lead us along. All right, let's turn our Bible to Luke chapter 2, please. Luke chapter 2. And we're going to read verses 41 through 49. You could follow with me in your Bible, if you would. Luke chapter 2, verse 41 is where we will begin. Luke chapter 2, verse 41. The Bible says, Now his parents went to Jerusalem every year at the feast of the Passover. When he was 12 years old, they went up to Jerusalem after the custom of the feast. And when they had fulfilled the days, as they returned, the child Jesus tarried behind in Jerusalem, and Joseph and his mother knew it not, or knew not of it. But they, supposing him to have been in the company, went a day's journey. And they sought him among their kinfolk and acquaintance. And when they found him not, they turned back again to Jerusalem, seeking him. And it came to pass that after three days they found him in the temple, sitting in the midst of the doctors, both hearing them and asking them questions. And all that heard him were astonished at his understanding and answers. And when they saw him, they were amazed. And his mother said unto him, Son, why hast thou thus dealt with us? Behold, thy father and I sought thee sorrowing. And he said unto them, How is it that ye sought me? Wist ye not that I must be about my father's business? Hmm, let's have a word of prayer. Dear Father, we thank you for this passage of Scripture. We thank you for all the Scripture, inspired of God, preserved forever, and given to us. We thank you so much, Lord, that we have the infallible, and inerrant, inspired, immutable Word of God that is right here that we can read and have and memorize. Thank you so much for giving us the truth that makes us free. Now tonight, as we look into the Word of God, I pray that by your Holy Spirit, you'd open the lips of your servant to speak in the heart of every person, whether they are here in this place or watching or listening, to receive the Word of God, that it might do its work and have its fruit in our lives, that it might challenge us and change us. Well, Lord, we just give ourselves to you now and submit ourselves and ask that you might minister to us. And we'll give you all the glory, honor, and praise in the name of our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. This is a story of the young child, Jesus. He's 12 years old. His family has traveled from Nazareth to Bethlehem, for the, or to Jerusalem, for the yearly Passover feast. Upon returning at the end of one day's journey, they discovered that Jesus was not with them. And, and now, this wasn't uncommon because uh, when you were traveling in a caravan, you would have kinfolk, you would have people from your town, and uh, you'd all travel together in a caravan. The children would run back and forth, and they'd ride with this family, and they'd ride with that family. But in the evening, <coughs> everyone would get together because they're, getting, they're preparing for the night. And so evening had come, and they're looking for Jesus, and they went over to this, uh, uh, this family and went over to another family, and finally they had exhausted all the families that were in the caravan, and there was no Jesus. Now, can you imagine the panic that must have set in to the hearts and minds of Joseph and Mary as they got to the started to get to the end of the caravan, and there were less and less opportunities for Jesus to be found, and they get to the last one, and he's not anywhere in the caravan. And they are a day's journey away. You can imagine what they're thinking. Where is he? How, how is he? Is he okay? Uh, who's he with? You can imagine, they're saying, I wonder if he's sick, I wonder if he's scared, and I wonder if worst, if he's kidnapped. And so they turn back immediately to Jerusalem to seek for the boy. <clears throat> Verse 46 adds to the worries and fears of the parents because now they've searched for three days. Can you imagine? It takes you three days and you're looking for your son and you can't find him. And he's only 12 years old and he's in the capital, this huge city, Jerusalem with all kinds of nefarious individuals lurking about in every corner. Perhaps they were beginning to give up hope or allowing fear to overcome their emotions, and then there he is. They find him. 
They didn't find him where they would expect to find him. They found him in the temple, and the Bible says he was in the temple discussing with the doctors. Now, the Bible says that in verse 46, And it came to pass that after three days they found him in the temple sitting in the midst of the doctors. That's where he, that's where he deserves to be, isn't it? Right in the middle. Right in the midst. And these are not physicians. And it says here that, he, that he's both hearing them, and here's this phrase, and asking them questions. This phrase, asking them questions, is epirotop. Autos. It means inquiring with baffling questions. The Lord Jesus was not asking them questions because he needed the answers. He wasn't asking them the questions so that he could learn and grow. He was asking them questions they could not answer. He's only 12 years old. In verse 47, it says that these, these doctors were astonished at his understanding. Existemi suna es. It means put out of wits. Put out of wits. In other words, they were at their wits end with this boy. Here's a 12-year-old sitting there. These are doctors of the Old Testament. These are old men. They are seasoned men. They are educated men. They are the leaders of the community. They are the leaders of the synagogue. These are the guys that, you know, have the doctoral degrees. And here's a 12-year-old, and he's sitting there, and he's baffling them and taking them to their wit's end with questions that they cannot answer. But he can. Amen. He's telling them things they didn't ever understood before. And it says they were astonished at his understanding. The word understanding is talking about his intellect. And this means that he bewildered them with the power of his intellect. At 12 years old. 12 year old boy causing these learned doctors of the Old Testament to be beside themselves and unable to withstand his intelligence and his wisdom. Now his mother and, his, and, and, and Joseph are amazed by the sight. And so they ask him why he had done this. In other words, they want to know, Don't, what's, we were scared to death, we were worried about you. Why did you stay behind? Why didn't you tell us? Why did you let us go off without you? And he says this, how is it that you sought me? Wished you not that I must be about my father's business? Now, the father's business, they're thinking in their mind, your father's a carpenter. What do you mean the father's business? You're not at the father's business. Your father's business is back in Nazareth. It's a carpenter shop. Because look what it says when she asked the question. In verse 48, And when they saw him, they were amazed. And his mother said unto him, Son, why hast thou thus dealt with us? Behold thy what? Thy father and I have sought thee sorrowing. But I want you to look over in verse 43 and see what God says about it. And when they had fulfilled the days as they returned, the child Jesus tarried behind Jerusalem, and Joseph and his mother knew it not. See, God knew the truth, didn't he? And so, here, Mary and Joseph are thinking, your father, well, here's your father. But God said, no, he's, no Joseph isn't his father. And Jesus knew that Joseph wasn't his father because Jesus said, wish you not I should be about my father's business? Mm -hmm. I think when he said that, the first thought they thought about was what? And the next thing they thought about was, wow. 
his father's God. They knew Joseph wasn't his father. Mary knew. This wasn't a surprise to her, she knew. But they had come to the point where they had actually started to believe, you know, they, they looked at it as, as Joseph was the father, and he was, I understand that. In many, many ways he performed the duties of the father. But in the real essence of the matter, the Bible's clear to say Joseph and his mother, and Jesus is clear to say I must be about my father's business, and my father's business is in carpentry. Right. The father's business. What is the father's business? Well, Jesus told us that he came to seek and save that which was lost. The Father's business is the business of saving the lost. It's not just the business of saving the lost. It's the business of seeking and saving the lost. Did you catch it? The Father's business is seeking and saving. That means he goes after the lost. He looks for the lost. And he'll save the lost if they'll trust him to do it. Now then, we who have been saved and born into God's family spiritually, should we not also be about the Father's business? Sure we should. Are we, are we sons of God? Should we not, did he not say, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature? So shouldn't we, as the children of God, also be about the Father's business? What is the Father's business? Listen to me. It's seeking and saving that which is lost. I want to look at this business for the next few minutes. It's the biggest business on planet Earth, and it's the most important. Whatever else we do and whatever else we are, we are to have a hand in the Father's business. I call the Father's business, I think it is, if, if, if it could have a placard on a wall or a shingle that was hanging, I think it would say, Heavenly Father and Son, fishers of men. I want to share three aspects or job descriptions this evening in this firm called Heavenly Father and Sons, fishers of men. We're born into that family. Do you understand that? We're born into the family of God and we're born into the family business. Amen. When you got saved, you, you were born into the family business of seeking and saving that which is lost. But I want to look, number one tonight, at God's job. God's job. Now listen, God's got a lot of jobs. Like, you know, running the universe. But God's job in this business is to fill me. Ephesians 5.18 says, And be not drunk with wine when it is excess, but be what? Filled with the Spirit. According to Romans 6.13, I'm to yield my members as instruments of righteousness unto God. And according to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 4, I should know how to possess my vessel in sanctification and honor. What is my vessel? It is me. It is my body. And I am to possess. I am, that word possess here means to control. I am to control this vessel in honor and sanctification. My members are to be instruments of righteousness unto God. Now let's add Romans 12, 1 here, where the Bible says, Present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. So what do we have a picture of? We have a picture of bringing our bodies as instruments to be used of God and as a vessel that we've kept clean and ready to be filled with the Holy Spirit. That's, how, that's what we're supposed to bring to God. We bring our members to God as instruments of righteousness to be used by Him. And we keep our vessels clean so when we bring them and present them to the Heavenly Father, they're fillable. He can fill them with the Holy Spirit. This is what, listen, this is what Isaiah said when he said, here am I. Remember Isaiah? 
He saw the Lord high and lifted up and his train filled the temple and his voice made everything shake and Isaiah fell on his face at the holiness and power and majesty of God and he had no strength within him. And what? And God said, who can I send? And, and, Abra, and um, Isaiah said, here am I. What was he doing? He was presenting his body, a living sacrifice to God. He was bringing his vessel to God. But I want you to notice that he also said that he was a man of unclean lips and he dwelt among a people of unclean lips. In other words, Isaiah was saying, Lord, I need to be cleansed as a vessel. I want, I want to present a clean vessel. I want to present instruments that are ready to be used of God. Go with me to 2 Timothy chapter 2. 2 Timothy chapter 2. And look with me in verse 20. The Bible says, but in a great house there are not only vessels of gold and of silver, but also of wood and of earth, and some to honor and some to dishonor. If a man therefore purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified, and meet for the master's use, and prepared unto every good work. Now we got the master's great house. What's he talking about here? He's talking about <coughs> the church. It's a great house. This is the house of God, isn't it? And it's a great house. And he says, I have in that house vessels of honor. I have some gold, silver vessels. I have some vessels of dishonor. I've got some wooden vessels. Now he said, if a man, in verse 21, purge himself of these, what's he talking about? He's talking about all the things that preceded that verse. Cleaning ourselves up. Keeping our lives clean. Remember, we are vessels. We're to possess our vessels. God has given me a vessel he has purchased it with his blood. I am a steward of that vessel, and I have a responsibility to keep that vessel clean so that God can fill me with his spirit and use me anytime he wants. He shouldn't have to come down and get the vessel and put it under hot water and put some soap in there and get the old SOS pad out and scrub and scrub and scrub to get that vessel ready. He wants that vessel to be ready when he wants it. And that's why we're supposed to keep ourselves clean. And that's why we're, we're, we put, bring ourselves before God and confess our sin and he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and what? Amen. Cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And so here are these vessels and he says, you know, if you'll keep yourself clean, you shall be a vessel unto honor. And there's that word again, sanctified. And meet or fit for the master's use. The vessel that is used is the vessel that is purged and ready to be filled. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 10 tells me that I am God's workmanship. Philippians chapter 2 verse 12 says, For it is God which worketh in you, both to will and do of his good pleasure. And how does God work in us? He works in us by his Holy Spirit. And how does he work in us by his Holy Spirit? By filling us with his Spirit. It's like filling a vessel with the power it needs to do its job. God's job, if you will, is to fill me with his Spirit so I can do my job. God's job is to fill you with his Spirit to do your job. But we need to be clean vessels. We need to be sanctified vessels. Point number two is my job. All right, what's God's job? God's job is to fill me. Now, I'm going to look at my job. I'm talking about me, my job. You know what my job is? God's job is to fill me. My job is to fill this pulpit. Now, there are a lot of things I can do, and there are a lot of things that I do do, but my job is to fill this pulpit. God's called me to pastor a church. He's called me to preach the word. That's my number one job, is to fill this pulpit. I'm not just to stand behind this pulpit and deliver some garbage that I found in the world's trash can. 
I am not to stand behind this pulpit and deliver warmed over hash browns and leftovers. I'm called by God to stand behind this pulpit and feed the flock. I'm supposed to bring milk for strong bones and meat for strong muscles. Let's see what Paul said about his job in 2 Timothy chapter 1. Just turn a page to your left and verse 11. Look what Paul said. Paul said, whereunto I am appointed a preacher and an apostle and a teacher of the Gentiles. See what Paul told Timothy his job was in 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 2. A few pages to your right. He says, preach the word. Be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, and exhort with all longsuffering and doctrine. And so he said, Timothy, I've been appointed by God to preach the word. He said, now Timothy, you've been appointed by God to preach the word. Look what he says in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 17. See if you can find that place. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 17. Paul again, talking about his job. He said, for Christ sent me not to baptize, but to what? Preach the gospel. Not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. He said, not with worldly wisdom, and not with worldly uh, philosophies. And then he says in verse 18, For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved it's the power of God. Go to Titus chapter 1, verse 3. Paul again speaking about his job. He says in verse 23, But hath in due time manifested his word through what? Preaching which is committed unto me, according to the commandment of God our Savior. I want you to notice, he said, but hath in due times manifested his word through preaching. He didn't say through Bible reading. He didn't say that. Are we to read our Bibles? Yes, we are. But what, how did he say he's going to manifest his word? Through preaching. See, when people say, well, I don't know, I don't need to go to church. I I, I read my Bible every day. No, 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 no. God said he's going to manifest his word through preaching. He's going to show forth his word through preaching. He's going to use preaching of the word of God to open the eyes of our understanding and help us to see things that we will not see without preaching. Because when you're reading your Bible, there's no one spitting on the front row and yelling to the back row. We read the Word of God so often in a monotone, and we read it as we want to read it and as we want to hear it, but when there's preaching, you get what you get. God said, I'm going to manifest my Word through preaching. He said, this was committed unto me. Paul didn't choose it. See, Paul didn't choose it, but God committed it to him. See what the disciples said in Acts chapter 6. Acts chapter 6, look at verse 2 and look at verse 4. Acts chapter 6 and verse 2, it says here, Then the twelve called the multitude of the disciples unto them and said, listen to this, It is not reason that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Look, there's a thousand things that needed to be done. And the the disciples, these twelve, they said, listen, man, we we know how to do all that, but it's not fit, it's not the right thing, it's not the best thing for us to leave the Word of God to go do that. Now look at verse 4. But we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the what? Ministry of the Word. Micah the prophet in 1 Kings 22, 14 says, As the Lord liveth, what the Lord saith unto me, that will I speak. You see, that's preaching. 
Whatever else I am supposed to do, I'm, I'm supposed to fill this pulpit. That's my job. That's why I'm here. That's why God called me. That's why God sent me. That's why I'm here for that purpose. If I stop doing that, I've stopped doing my job. And let me say this, if I do not do my job, then the children of God go hungry. But I can't do my job unless he does his job, right? What's his job? His job is to fill me. What's my job? My job is to fill this pulpit. I am the Lord's servant. He provides the milk and the meat. I deliver it for him. You know, you have, you have those people... Uh, at the restaurant. They're called waiters and waitresses. They don't cook the food. They just serve it. Right? But God's a little different than, than the chef in the kitchen because you order what you want when you're at the restaurant. You don't get to order what you want here. God, he's the cook. He's the one that's got the milk. He's the one that got the meat. He's in the back, he's in the back kitchen. He's looking in his pantry and he's saying, I think I need a little of this. I think we'll put a little of that in. We'll take some of this. We'll put that in. And God serves it. Sometimes you don't like it. But it's good for you. Did you ever hear anybody say, eat it. It's good for you. <laughs> You're not leaving the table till you eat all of it. Well, I don't like it. It's good for you, eat it. That's what God says. Sometimes you come to church and we have everything you like. And you're sitting there saying, oh, boy, this is good. Yeah, I like this. Sometimes you come and say, man, I don't care too much for that. <laughs> but see, I'm glad God's the one that sets the table. I'm just a waiter. I'm just going back into the kitchen and saying, what do you got for him this week, Lord? Ooh. <laughs> don't forget to do your job. <laughs> You better fill me, because if I'm going to deliver this. God's job is to fill me. My job is to fill the pulpit. And, number three, your job is to fill the pews. It seems that churches expect the pastors to do it all. And many pastors, because they love the Lord and love the people and are conscientious, are willing to do it all. And even try to do it all. But the problem with doing that is that something will suffer. That's what the disciples, that's what the twelve stood. They said, could we do that? Yeah, we could do that. Would we do a good job at doing that? Yeah, we'd do a good job at doing that. But you know what? If we do that, then who's going to do this? If we do that, we'll have to take away from this. So what is it that you want to suffer? Would you rather suffer empty pews or an empty pulpit? See if the pa right, neither one. But if the pa okay, now listen to your job then. Your job is to fill the pews. But if you expect me to fill the pews, then I'm not going to be able to fill the pulpit and the pews. Got it? Doesn't mean I have no responsibility to go soul winning. Doesn't mean I have no responsibility to witness. But it means my job is not to fill the pews. My job is to fill the pulpit. Your job is to fill the pews. You understand? But if you expect me to fill all the pews, then don't get upset when there's nothing coming from the pulpit. Would you rather have a painted pantry or a powerful pulpit? You see, I can paint. I'm a good painter. But I'm not called to paint. That's not my job. So the disciples says they couldn't and wouldn't do everything. They said, you take care of that business and we'll take care of going to study in the word and prayer. Go with me to Luke chapter 14. Luke chapter 14, believe me, I'm not, I'm not grinding any axes tonight. That noise you hear in the pulpit, shh, I, I'm not. <laughs> Amen. I'm just, I'm just, I, the Lord just, you know, gave me this. I went in the, I went in the, into the kitchen, this is what he gave me, so. Amen. All right, so we're in Luke chapter 14, right? Let's go to verse 16. 
Then said he unto him, A certain man made a great supper and bade many, and sent his servant at supper time to say to them that were bidden, Come, for all things are now ready. And they all with one consent began to make excuse. The first said unto him, I have bought a piece of ground, and I must needs go and see it. I pray thee have me excused. And another said, I have bought five yoke of oxen, and I go to prove them, and I pray thee have me excused. And another said, I have married a wife, and therefore I cannot come. So that servant came and showed his Lord these things. Then the master of the house, being angry, said to the servant, Go out quickly into the streets and lanes of the city, and bring in hither the poor and the maimed and the halt and the blind. And the servant said, Lord, it is done as thou hast commanded, and yet there is room. And the Lord said unto the servant, Go out into the highways and hedges, and compel them to come in, that my house may be what? <coughs> Filled. Now, I understand the biblical interpretation of this passage. But what I wish to do tonight is make an application for us. And this, here's the application. Every Lord's day, the Lord makes a great supper. And he wants his house to be full because he's going to serve his great supper. Now, if you're not here, that's one more empty chair. That's one more empty spot. He went, what kind of house does he want? What did he say? I want my house to be what? To be full. So if you're not here, is it full? No. So by not being here, there's one empty seat. Maybe you say, well, you know, no one knows whether I come or not. God knows. No one cares whether I come or not. God cares. He sees. Most of you sit in the same place. Week after week. Sometimes you like to mess with my head and you move and I, I'm looking for you and I can't find you. But most of you sit in the same place all the time. So all I have to do is look over in a certain area and I can see whether you're here or not. That's right. I wonder if God can do that. Amen. You think? That's right. You think God looks and says, where, where's so-and-so? Now he knows where you are. But he's saying, look, that chair's empty. I wanted my house to be full. And look, that, there's an empty chair right there. God cares. God knows. But the truth is that people are just not beating a path to the church house on Sunday. Isn't that true? That's right. So he instructs his servant, that's you, you're a servant of God. He instructs his servant to go out into the streets and lanes and highways and even beat the hedges to get people to come into his house. I've got a supper plan. Where is everybody? Go get them. Go in the highways and hedges and lanes and the streets. And he told his servant to make it compelling to them. He said, compel them to come in. He's not <coughs> saying, grab them by the arm and drag them in here against their will. He's saying, you need to have a compelling invitation. You need, to be, you need to compel them with your words and compel them with your enthusiasm and compel them with your excitement and compel them with words about the Great Supper. Make it compelling to them. Here, I want to invite you to church with me. Oh, yeah, I really want to go. I wonder how compelling we make Sunday supper in the house of God sound to those who are in the highways and the hedges. You see, it's got to be compelling enough to leave the hedges. It's got to be high, compelling enough to leave the highway, to leave the lanes, to leave the streets, to leave what they're doing. There's a lot of things in the world that people can be doing when God has a great supper prepared. And We've got to, we, we've, somehow, we've got to have a compelling case. Why should you leave, you know, your comfort of your home and come to church? Why should you leave uh, the golf course and come to church? As I read through my New Testament, I find that God uses the individuals one by one to reach people. In John chapter 4, we find the woman that Jesus met at the well, and she runs into the city and she tells everybody about Jesus. 
In Mark chapter 5, we find the Lord Jesus telling the maniac of Gadara, who he had just delivered from a legion of demons, and put him in his right mind, he tells him to stay and tell everyone what I've done for you. Go let them see you. Go let them hear you. And they will be compelled to trust me. When they see what I've done to you, when they see what I've made out of you, when they hear what you have to say about me, they'll come. No difference with us. People need to hear. They need to see what Jesus has done for us. They need to hear what Jesus has done for us. They need to see that Jesus is a compelling reason to come to church. I read in Luke chapter 2 about the shepherds. When they're leaving the manger, the Bible says they went out throughout the region telling people all about Jesus, all the things that they'd heard. They told everybody. They were rejoicing and telling everybody. The woman said, hey, let me tell you a man that told me everything I ever did. The maniac went out and said, hey, I got to tell you, I, I, was, I was possessed by a legion of demons, and, I, and Jesus saved me, and he cleansed me, and he freed me. He needs to go to people who have problems and situations and circumstances that are overwhelming and say, yeah, but look what Jesus did for me. He can do it for you. He loved me, and I was, I, I was a madman. I was demon-possessed, and he loved me, and he came to me. He saved me. We need to be like the shepherds and go out and tell people how wonderful Jesus is. All the things that we've heard from the Word of God, just share them. Sometimes we get in a rut when it comes to soul winning and witnessing. Sometimes we get in a rut and we, we feel like we have to do everything just perfectly or we have to do this. Listen, you know what witnessing is? Witnessing is just being compelling. You see, that's your job. Your job is witnessing for Christ, witnessing about Christ. Bringing them in for the Sunday supper that God has provided for them in his word. You're the salt that interacts with all the people that you come in contact with every day. You've got salt that reaches where my salt can't reach or doesn't reach. You're the light that is supposed to show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Your light shines where my light doesn't go. especially to those with whom you have regular or repeated contact. You know, we meet people every, every week, right? We go to the bank, we meet people. Is there any, com you know, we, I, uh, just for your information, there's been a young lady that's visited the church a couple times from the bank I go to. Why? Because when they say, oh, I'm sorry, I'm taking so long, no problem. You see, you can just be compelling in your person, in your demeanor, in your words, in your actions, in your reactions. Now they know I'm the preacher because I bring in the, you know, this is a great calorie deposit and I'm the, they all know me and everything. But they watch me when I come in. They hear me when I come in. They're observant. And there needs to be a compelling thing about me that recommends Jesus Christ. And it goes like that everywhere we go. Everybody we meet. And the ones we meet the most and the ones we meet more often, we ought to have a, it ought to become more compelling and more compelling. Amen. Have people, I, I, how compelling is your light? Have people seen a change? Do they see a difference? The, di the change and difference that only Jesus can make? There are friends out there in the hedges. There are family members out there in the highways. There are co-workers out there in the streets and strangers in the lane who need a little word of hope and encouragement and an invitation to come to the supper. See, what most people out in the community think about church is, you know, you come in, you say a couple creeds, you sing a couple songs, you get a yabba-dabba-doo and you go home. 
There are people out there that have no idea what supper means. They don't know, they've never eaten at God's great supper in their life. And they walk in here and they go, wow, it's different. Never heard anything like that before. No, it's not because of me. It's because of the supper that God has prepared. I'm just bringing it out of the kitchen and saying, here. But you need to bring them in. We sing that hymn, bring them in, bring them in, bring them in. We're not bringing them in. Like we could bring them in. We're not bringing them in like we should bring them in. God said he went in his house before. We sent the servant out. And he sent the servant out. And he sent the servant out. He kept sending that servant out until his house was full. You know, there are people out there looking for hope. There are people out there starving for truth. There are people languishing into despair. There are people lost in their sins. And they need someone to come and say, I know, I know what you need. You need to get something to eat. I know a great place. In Romans chapter 10, verses 13 and 14, the Bible says, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And we all know that verse, and we love that verse. But then it says, how then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? Right. You see, I didn't choose the foolishness of preaching to save some. He did. The preacher can't always go where they are. So you need to bring them where the preacher is. I know it's difficult. But the more we persist, the more it pays off. Amen. I know we get tired of being told no, but a hundred no's are washed away by one yes. Amen. I can't help but think about the young man that got saved in Sunday school class this morning. Amen. He sat right over there, and during the invitation, he, his eyes were pinned on me. And I looked at him, and I said, did you get saved? He said, yeah. I mean, it was like, yeah, I got saved. Now, how did he get here? I'll tell you how he get here. Somebody brought him. There was an empty seat. And someone filled the seat with their friend. And their friend got saved. We've had people bring their coworkers in here and fill a seat with a coworker, and a coworker gets saved. We've had people bring their spouses in and fill a seat with a spouse, and a spouse got saved. We've had people bring relatives in and fill a chair with a relative and a relative got saved. You, you hear what I'm saying? They can't get saved if they don't hear. And they can't hear if they're not here. And they won't come here unless you go there and compel them to come here. Don't ask them, hey, come to church. They've been to church. They've probably been in much church. They don't need to come to church. You need to, you need to think of some other way. You've got to do something else. Uh, hey, I want you to come to church. Ah, I've been there, done that. I've been to church too many times. Ah, that's all this. No, you need to have some compelling language. God will give it to you. When it, what did the girl say? Hey, come in here. She didn't say, hey, let's go to church. She said, hey, come. Let me tell you. You've got to hear a man told me every, everything I ever did. Among other things, I understand God's job is to fill me. Among other things, I understand but my job is to fill the pulpit. And among other things, I understand your job is to fill the pews. You understand these, these seats are here for your friends. These empty seats are here for your relatives. These empty seats are here for the people you bank with, the people you buy groceries from. These empty seats are here from the people you go to school with, the people that you interact with on a daily basis or a weekly basis. That's what these empty chairs are for. They're for people. And God wants every single one of them filled. And so he says to his servant, go out, be compelling. Bring them in so that my house can be full. That's one way we can be like Jesus and be about the Father's business.
Let's bow for a word of prayer. Our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed again. Listen, I, I don't want to let the Father down, so I'm trying to do the best I can to hold my end up by His grace. Will you join me and be found about the Father's business? You have a job in the Father's business. Be about it. Maybe tonight you need to come and say, Lord, I haven't been about the Father's business. I'm about my business. I'm about my family's business. But I'm not all too much about the Father's business. But that's really why I'm here. Maybe you need to come tonight and say, Lord, help me be about the business. Help me be concerned about going out and bringing them in. Help me to, to have a life that's compelling and help me to have words that are compelling. Help me to have a vocabulary and a, and, a, and, a, and a way to describe what church is that's compelling. <coughs> Maybe here tonight and you've never been saved. You know, there's a place in the Father's house for you and there's a place around the Father's table and he wants you to come and be part of his family today by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. The Bible says, for by grace are you saved through faith and that not of yourselves. It's a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. The Bible said, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And my dear friend tonight, I want you to know that Jesus loves you and God the Father loves you and God the Holy Spirit, this triune God in all his fullness loves you and has made a way for you to be saved and to have your sins forgiven. And that was for Jesus to come to earth and take your sins upon himself and to die on Calvary's cross and to shed his blood and to be buried and rise again from the dead. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. And the Bible says that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. If you want to be in God's family, you must come through Jesus. If you want everlasting life, you must come to Jesus and you must believe that he is who he says he is, the Son of God and God the Son. And you must receive him for what he's done. He's the Savior and the only Savior. Call upon him while he's near. Trust in him before it's too late. If there's anybody like that here tonight, they would say, I need to trust Christ as my Savior. Lift your hand up. Let me see it. Say, preacher, I'm in the midst of this congregation. And I need Christ. And I don't want to die and go to hell. I don't want to go to hell being religious. I want to go to heaven being saved. Anybody like that here tonight? Father, we thank you tonight for your word. And we thank you, Lord, that you do your job. When we have a clean vessel and ask to be filled, you fill us. And Father, help us to present our bodies as living sacrifices. Our instrument, our members as instruments of righteousness unto God. And our vessels as clean vessels ready to be filled. Help us to go out and do our jobs, whatever they might be. Help us to fill your, your house. Father, I pray you'd bless us now as we have the invitation. You glorify yourself as only you can. And we give ourselves to you and give you the praise and glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand, please. <laughs> We're going to sing our closing hymn. Our closing hymn is number 458. Maybe you'd just like to come tonight and say, Jesus, help me do my job. Help me see my job and help me do my job. Or maybe you need to come and say, help me do my job better. Help me to do my job more faithfully. Or maybe you'd like to come and say, Lord, there was an empty seat real close to me tonight. And I'm going to go out this week and try to find a human being for that seat. Will you guide me? Will you direct me? Will you bless me with success? Father, I want to bring someone in. I want to fill your house up. Use me. We're going to sing. If you need to be saved, you come and see me if you would, please. I am thine, O Lord. I have heard thy voice and it told thy love to me. But I long to in the arms of faith and be closer drawn to thee draw me nearer nearer bless
exalted Lord to the cross where thou hast died. Draw me nearer, 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 blessed Lord, to thy precious bleeding side. Consecrate me now to thy service, Lord, by the power of grace divine. Let my soul look up with a steadfast hope, and my will be lost in thine. Draw me nearer, nearer, blessed Lord, to the cross where thou hast died. Draw me nearer, 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 blessed Lord, to thy precious bleeding sign. Maybe for some reason or another, you, it, it's almost impossible for you to actually go out. But you can pray for others to go out. And the Bible says we're supposed to pray the Lord of the harvest that he'll send forth laborers. Where? Into his harvest. To bring the harvest where? In. So if you can't go, you can pray that God will send others. You can pray for others to go. And you can pray for the people you know who need to come. Let's just be involved in the Father's business, seeking those that are lost, so he can save them. We're going to sing the last stanza. If you need to pray, you feel free to come. There are depths of love that I cannot know Till I cross the narrow sea There are heights of joy that I may not reach Till I rest in peace with thee Draw me nearer, nearer, blessed Lord, to the cross where Thou hast died. Draw me nearer, 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 blessed Lord, to Thy precious bleeding side. All right, don't forget we have a presentation for you of the trip to Spain. It will follow immediately upon Pastor Rivera coming to close us in prayer. Let's pray. Father, thank you for uh, what we have heard tonight. And I pray that um, each and every one of us here uh, just... Uh, take into practice what we have heard and just help us uh, to be a blessing to the church. In Jesus' name, amen.